Hello again, Penn, Ohio viewers. This is Mike Odell from the Penn, Ohio chapter of the SCTE. Today's video is brought to you in collaboration with Antronix and the Penn, Ohio chapter of the SCTE. Joining us today is Neil Tang, president and CEO of Antronix. We're extremely excited to have Neil joining us today to talk about passives. How are we doing today, Neil? I'm doing great, thank you, and uh, for having this uh, webinar. Glad to be here. All right, well, we appreciate the partnership. And as we talked before, I think passives are one of the great misunderstood parts in the HFC network. They're truthfully vital to the way the network works and the, the distribution of services to our customers, but we often overlook them in favor of things that are more exciting, they're more technologically advanced, you know, fiber optic nodes and amplifiers and different things. But the reality is passives are critically important. And if you understand how they work, you can really understand impairments and behaviors in the network. So I, uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your, your busy schedule and quite frankly, your vacation uh, to, to join us and record this session. Great. Pleasure to be here. Um, Passive's been part of Antronix's uh, bloodline for since 1980, since we were in inception. So um, I think uh, there'll be a very good discussion today on passives. Awesome. All right. Well, let's start off with the overview of what is a hardline passive. Okay. So we have um, just a basic little overview of hardline passives. And here is a network infrastructure based on where hardline passives typically are used. So First hardline passive here is a power inserter. Basically, this injects AC from the power supply into the hardline network. And as you can see in the drawing, the red line shows where AC and RF is in the network. Um, the black lines are just RF, and you see those going out through the drop. Um, other hardline passives, including splitters, shown here is a two way splitter, which equally splits the signal. Here we have a directional coupler, and we will go into each of these passes in more detail. Uh, this is actually splitting unequally the signal. One goes through the main line, and another coupled port is powering an access point in this presentation. And mostly use our taps. So we have two, four, and eight-way taps shown here. A tap is used to cascade down the line and tap off the main signal to go into uh, each F port and each F port is connected to the home. So F ports typically don't have AC going down the drop. It's just RF. Uh, but you also do have drop power taps here, which uh, can be replaced in the same housing as regular tap. And you put a drop power tap in. And one of those F ports, uh, one or more, uh, can access power. So you turn on power to those F ports to power, let's say, a Wi-Fi, CBRS radio um, in the network. And There's more, uh, more and more things hanging off of the coaxial networks today uh, yeah. to serve general you know, open communications, to your point, CBRS radio heads, now Wi-Fi access points, um, other communication devices, camera systems, et cetera. So the drop power taps are extremely handy in instances like that. Um, or sometimes we see them even fed by directional couplers with something like a pin to F on the tap leg because they can also route RF and AC to uh, a standalone device. Right. And it's interesting because the drop power taps were originally invented um, to do VOIP services. So back at least 20 years ago, um, voice over IP used to be powered uh, some of them used to be powered through the network as opposed to battery powered or house powered. So the drop power cap was originally developed for that, but then the current loading for the uh, powering was increased to be able to to provide the power for Wi-Fi access points and CBRS radios. So, and the other line passes that we're talking about here are equalizers, and the equalizers is usually um, in between the cascades in the middle of the cascade to compensate for cable loss. So 
if you uh, if you look at the design right on that particular map, I and, and you were to count the number of components, uh -huh. there would certainly be more passive devices than active devices, right? Right. Um, so in terms of volume, passives are everywhere, and they're they're super critical to the conditioning and the delivery of the signals. But again, I I think they tend to be overlooked. So. Uh, uh, look forward to deep diving into all these passive devices. Yeah, and sometimes we use a number just for estimation that there are between, you know, possibly 20 caps per mile, 20 to 30 uh, passes, I'd say, per mile in a network as opposed to amplifiers. So there are a lot more passives in the network uh, than actives. Yeah, awesome. So uh, as we talk about taps and passives and um, infrastructure. Uh, I think it's good to go over some of the basics in terms of what the uh, network requires. And one of the performance parameters typically discussed in specifications uh, is insertion loss. So I want to clarify and explain uh, what is insertion loss. So here we have a passive device with an input and output. And insertion loss is the transmission loss through a device. It's going from in to out. So typically you have a power in, power out. The In a passive device, the output power is lower than the input power. So um, some of the loss is actually loss in the passive itself. So the insertion loss is the difference in dB between the input power and the output power. Um, so in this case, we have input power, let's say it's 40 dBmB coming in, and the output power is 39 dBmB. So the insertion loss through the device is actually a 1 dB insertion loss. And some parameters of products have that specified in their uh, specifications. And you could also do this in milliwatts. Um, in the industry, we typically talk about in the dBs, but if you actually talk about absolute power, milliwatts, uh, this is the formula for power conversion. But simply, if you plug in the information, the numbers, uh, you still get 1 dB insertion loss associated with that number. But insertion I loss. Gonna, oops, mm -hmm. Sorry, Neil. I, I do think we're going to talk later about the different devices that have different insertion losses, right? Yes, we will. So, so not every device is the same with what their insertion loss is, um, but there's a way to understand that. Correct. And, you know, we always want devices with lower insertion loss. Lower insertion loss is always better, uh, less loss through the device. Um, so, you know, insertion loss is always a positive number as well. So here is, let's say, a in-home two-way splitter. Um, you can see the specifications here where insertion loss is varies over frequency. So typically when you have a, uh, a specification of insertion loss, let's say you say three and a half dB or four dB, it could be a typical or mean insertion loss, but true insertion loss actually varies with frequency. So in this axis, the X axis, you have frequency and um, Y axis, you have the actual uh, S1, um, actually, it's the S2 one here. So the insertion loss associated with it has a different um, insertion loss with regards to frequency. So an ideal splitter, uh, a lossless splitter, insertion loss is typically 3 dB, but nothing is actually ideal. Uh, there are internal losses within the splitter, and as you can see, the insertion loss is closer to 3.5 to 4 dB when higher high frequency range. So as products are also cascaded in the network, uh, the insertion loss and frequency response of this curve is added together as well. So each, the total cascaded frequency response is actually the sum of each individual device that's in the network. So it's kind of important to have a very good uh, frequency response and good insertion loss with each device you put in the network. The one device in the network will corrupt the whole net, whole cascaded frequency response. So I think we'll talk a little bit later about attenuation as a product of frequency, but there is a little bit of shape 
um, when you look at the frequency response of th this passive, and I suspect that, that line passives and drop passives are going to behave fairly similarly, right? right. Because they're, they're both effectively power dividers. Yes. So you take your input power and divide it equally, uh, in this instance, into two parts. So right. um, that shape is important, as we'll, we'll see that have an impact, to your point, as it cascades uh, multiple devices uh, down the line. Correct. And in search and loss here as an in-home device, this does not pass power and is closer to your ideal 3 dB lossless splitter. But as you pass power through a line passive that is passing AC as well, uh, there are parts that have more loss in the line passive and may have more insertion loss because it passes AC as well. So it's a little bit further away from the three and a half, three dB ideal mark, but this is an in-home version and you can see the frequent response for the in-home splitter. Very good. I think another time we'll talk about S parameters and what those mean. Um, yes. Maybe not today, but those are important. Yeah. And this graph is labeled correctly, but the, the Y axis is says S11 here, so be S21. Um, we're going to talk about return loss next. So um, it's best to talk about return loss when you're discussing a system impedance. So in cable TV, um, the broadband network and coaxes have a system impedance of 75 ohms. So you have the input and the output device is 75 ohms, and if you have a product that is a perfect 75 ohms, you do have maximum power transfer, and that's ideal. So everything goes in, comes out of the product, um, and it's uh, ideal situation of 75 ohms. But in reality, um, no, nobody, nothing is a perfect 75 ohms. So impedance varies with frequency, uh, it's not perfect. So when you have power in, you do get some reflected signal coming back. So return loss is actually the difference in dB between the input power and the reflected power. So the larger the return loss, the less reflected power. So it is desired to have a higher return loss. So this is, you know, on the right is the same return loss for, uh, formula when you use uh, milliwatts as opposed to dB on the left. I think it bears a little bit of discussion in return loss as a term is, is another one of those things that may be a little bit misunderstood because mm -hmm. we talk about the return loss between like say a, a modem in a customer's home to a CMTS, which would dictate the transmits, but that's the, the sum total of upstream losses in the return path, but mm -hmm. it's not the same thing as return loss as measured at a device. Um, and you mentioned something very important is we always talk about uh, cable television systems as being 75 ohm systems. Well, in reality, they're nominally 75 ohms. Um, to your point, nothing is ever exact or precise. Um, so it's, it's the best we can do to try and make sure everything is as close to 75 ohms as possible to minimize the amount of impedance mismatches or reflections. Now, those are also under ideal conditions, right? And I think we'll right. talk about, you know, the impacts of, of defect or corrosion or other impairments uh, later. Yes. But ideally, the system is considered nominally 75 ohms. Correct. And nothing's exactly 75 ohms. And each impedance depends on frequency as well. So it's very frequency dependent on what that return loss of that device is. 